Hello guys and welcome to the first of four lectures dealing with river valley civilizations. This one's going to focus on Mesopotamia. Take a look at some of the key concepts that I want you guys to understand by the end of this presentation. Here are some of the key vocabulary I want you guys to understand by the end of this presentation. Two of these vocabulary terms you're only going to find in the Spodek text though, so you won't hear me talk about them today. Be aware of that. This first one, you probably think you know what it means, but the definition we'll be covering today is different, I think, from the one you're already familiar with, so keep that in mind. Okay, so like I said, today we'll be talking about the first of four river valley civilizations that we're going to cover throughout the course. Those four river valley civilizations are dealt with in chapters two to four of Spodek, and they range from roughly the 3000s to 400s BCE. This photograph is not of the river valley civilization we'll be discussing today, um, if you couldn't tell, it's actually of the Nile River Valley in Egypt. But I like to use it here anyway because it's a great reminder of why people chose to settle in River Valley civilizations in such large numbers. Take a look at the contrast between the lush vegetation that the river is supporting and the barren desert to either side. It's pretty clear to see why folks would choose to stay here and settle in such large numbers. But like I said today, we're not talking about the Nile River Valley. We're talking about instead the nearby Tigris and Euphrates River Valley in Mesopotamia. Um, if you haven't heard of Mesopotamia before, a good way to remember it, its location is that it's pretty much in modern day Iraq for the most part. So why are we starting in Mesopotamia? Well, that's because historians believe that the first civilizations developed there, and specifically developed in a place called Sumer, in this bottom right-hand section of Mesopotamia. The Sumerian folks, as you can see, were pretty creative, uh, pretty interesting characters, but uh, if this artwork that they created led you to believe that they also created the five-hour energy drink, that is not the case. They did create a lot of other very useful things, though, many of which we still use today. Some of their notable inventions were the wheel, the plow, and the sailboat. And what allowed them to create all these things? Well, one of the things we already talked about with early civilizations is that not everybody had to be a farmer you could be a full-time uh, political leader or religious leader or an inventor of certain objects. That job specialization allowed folks to focus on creating things that would make their society more complex, more advanced, would make life in their society easier for folks. The interesting thing about the wheel is that it wasn't first invented to be used for a transportation purpose. It was actually first invented to be used for shaping pottery, a potter's wheel like you see here. Which you can spin to shape that pottery um, as it uh, helps you rotate it. The plow, most of you guys are familiar with, was used to break up ground so that uh, plants could be planted um, more deeply in that ground and the roots could draw more nutrients out of that ground and therefore the plants would grow bigger and feed more members of the society. The sailboat um, isn't really like the sailboats you guys are familiar with today. 
This isn't anything that would be used on the open ocean or anything that um, would really survive well in rough waters. But it was used around coastal areas and it was used to navigate the Tigris and Euphrates rivers of Mesopotamia. Uh, it was particularly useful when the current of a river was flowing one way and you wanted to travel in the opposite direction. One thing we haven't talked about here is leisure time. Leisure time you guys might be familiar with is time you spend kicking back and relaxing. Um, but historians definition of leisure time is any time spent not producing food. So once again when someone is not producing food because someone else is feeding them they have time to do other things like create inventions. Keep in mind the historian's definition of leisure time. What world history themes do you see here? The creation of these inventions, job specialization. Hopefully you connected uh, the plow to humans interaction with their environment. Hopefully you connected um, the wheel and sailboat to other use of technology under the cultural development section and the job specialization really connects with theme four um, the economics and labor system specifically okay before we go any further into Mesopotamian history I'd like to talk about the term periodization and before I do that I'd like you guys to go ahead and complete a short activity for me take a look at the instructions take a look at my example and make your own periodization of your life history as best you can go ahead and pause the video take as much time as you need and I'll be back with you when you're done okay so how did that activity go for you did you learn a little bit about yourself? Were you able to understand yourself a little better? Maybe. What you just did, dividing your life up into time periods based on key events from those periods, and then giving each time period a label that related to those key events, that's called periodization. And world historians do this too. Um, they don't do it, obviously, with individuals' life stories, but they do it with world history. And they do it to try to understand world history more clearly. So let's take a look at historians' use of periodization as it relates to the development of Mesopotamian society. So you can see here, early Mesopotamian society members used stone tools. Eventually, they progressed to the use of copper tools, then on to bronze tools and iron tools later on that aren't pictured here. What historians have done is they've chosen to use the transition from one type of tool to another as those key points, those defining changes that represent a time period and they've labeled those time periods accordingly first the stone age then the copper age the bronze age the iron age etc etc so periodization can be a useful tool for historians and for students of history to understand um, certain time periods and development of a civilization a culture or history in general, but it does come with some problems. One of the biggest problems with periodization is that not all the River Valley civilizations we're going to study entered each one of these ages at the same time. Some skipped ages, some never worked with copper tools and went straight from stone tools to iron tools. So it's hard to say there's a stone age, a copper age, a bronze age, for every single River Valley civilization and you certainly can't say 
that they all happened at the same time. One of the other problems with periodization not listed here is that it makes us think that the stone tool use or the copper tool use or the bronze tool use was the most important thing that happened during that time period. And some folks might believe that and some folks might not, but it is something that's up for debate. Speaking of tool use, what world history themes do you think connect to that? If you were thinking in terms of humans' interaction with their environment um, and use of technology under culture, you're on the right track. So like I said, one of the problems with periodization is it can make us think that the labels for the time periods represent the only important things that happened during those time periods. But Mesopotamia was going through a bunch of other important changes at those same times as well. One of those important changes was that it was starting to see uh, social classes emerge within its society. I wonder if you guys can guess which of these jobs was valued most by Mesopotamian society, which was valued least, and which ones fell somewhere in between. Because remember, it's job specialization that happens in agricultural societies that eventually leads to social classes. And how much a society values a job can determine what social class that job falls under. So go ahead and take three minutes, make your best guess as to where you think each one of these falls in the social order, pause the video, I'll be back with you when you're done. Okay, let's line these up and see how you did. So, were you close? We'll talk about why each of these jobs was valued at the level it was throughout the remainder of this presentation. I've put these two on the same level because sometimes priests and priestesses were at the top and sometimes it was the other way around. We'll explain why that is later on as well. By the way, whenever we're talking about social classes, what theme do you think that connects to? If you guess theme five, you're doing well. So we talked about the emergence of different social classes in Mesopotamian society, but what factors do you think separated different types of people in that society? Take about three minutes to make your best guesses about how and where those social classes came from. Pause the video, I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, so let's talk about what some of those factors that separated folks in Mesopotamian society were. The first one we already kind of discussed during the last slide. Your job made a difference what social class you were a part of because different jobs had different levels of value attached to them by the society. Another factor was your gender. And this was because most of the high-value jobs were closed off to women in society. And this wasn't just Mesopotamian society, but you'll see that it was pretty much every other River Valley civilization as well. And your wealth, of course, made a difference. Um, you might have the same job as someone else, 
but perhaps you were able to accumulate more material goods than that person for whatever reason. That could make a difference. Your power, your influence over others in the society could make a difference as far as where you stood socially. And the laws of the society you lived in, Mesopotamia included, could make a difference as far as how much um, influence, how much wealth, uh, how much importance that you had in that society. If you haven't noticed already, there's probably some connections among these things. For instance, like I already said, job and gender could be tied together. Some jobs were simply closed to women. Depending on what job you did, you might be wealthier than someone else. Farmers fed the folks at the top of society, the scribes, the professional soldiers, the political leadership, the priests, the priestesses. And with your job, you oftentimes had a degree of power or influence. We're going to see in a moment that priests, priestesses, professional soldiers, uh, political leaders had more influence over the society than other folks. And speaking of influence, a lot of those folks at the top of society were the ones who created the laws. And of course they're going to create laws that solidify that power and influence for themselves and for the members of their social class in the future. There are probably more connections that I haven't even made here that you can see on your own. Okay, so we know that social classes were a big part of Mesopotamian society. But so was a powerful central government. And the way that government was organized was in the form of a city-state. Maybe you've heard this term before, but you're not quite sure what it means. Well, it is sort of what it sounds like. The city part is pretty self-explanatory, right? We all know what a city is. And if you didn't know, whenever historians refer to a state, they're talking really about a country, okay? So don't think in terms of Florida as a state. Think in terms of the United States being a state, Mexico being a state, Canada being a state. So when you put these two halves of the word together, it really kind of means city country. Um, and so it really is what it sounds like. A city state is a country, usually pretty small, controlled by a central government of a major city that's somewhere inside of that country, usually at the country's center. So that's what a city-state is. And the power of Sumerian city-states was most often expressed through something called monumental architecture. Well, what is monumental architecture? This image is one example of monumental architecture. It's a ziggurat, or a temple, from the city-state of Ur. But just because it's a religious structure, that doesn't make it in itself monumental. What makes it monumental is its size. It's absolutely huge, if you can tell by these little steps here. A person wouldn't be any taller than about here on the building. This is many stories high and most city-states had one or more pieces of monumental architecture like this one. So how can we tell that a state, that a country, had a strong central government based on its monumental architecture? Well, you need a couple things to build something like, like this. First of all, you need to have a lot of materials. Second, you need to have a lot of people. Third, you need to have a lot of time for those people to put in the effort to construct something like this out of those materials. And most of all, you have to have the organization that brings all of those things together. 
it's tough to get thousands of people to work for decades on a project like this, on a structure like this, that they're ultimately not even going to use themselves. It was built for other people, the leaders of the religion, the leaders of the government. So to get people to work that hard for that long shows that the central government, the state, had some serious power, had some serious control over those people, and they were able to exercise that power for an extended period of time. What themes do you think this slide relates to? This image of this temple and the state power that it took to construct. If you're guessing theme two for religion and architecture, absolutely, but also theme three for government organization, theme five for the division in social class that the leaders of the government had over the people who constructed such a temple. Okay, so if you guys couldn't tell from that last slide, religion and politics were pretty heavily intertwined in Mesopotamian society, not just the city-state of Ur. I wonder if you guys can guess how that situation came to be. Take about three minutes, see what you come up with, and I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, I may have gotten a little bit ahead of myself with that last question I asked you guys, so let's back up one step. Why do you think religion developed in Mesopotamia in the first place? And as you guys are considering possibilities, I really want you to focus on theme one, interaction between humans and the environment, especially that last word, environment. How could the Mesopotamian environment have played a role in the development of religion there. Take another three minutes and we'll piece all the pieces of the puzzle together when I come back. Okay, so let's start with environment. Most of you guys will remember from the creation myths you read that humans like to use stories, oftentimes very religious stories, to explain why their environment is the way it is. And the folks who lived in Mesopotamia were no different. They used their religious beliefs, their religious stories, to explain why their environment acted the way it did. So first of all, what was their environment like? Um, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were actually very unpredictable. Some years they would flood way too much, they would wash away crops, wash away houses, wash away people and their livestock. Some years they would not flood enough and there would be drought and there would not be enough water to uh, water their crops. Remember that irrigation was very, very important to folks living in river valleys because those rivers were the source of some of the nutrients that helped their crops grow and help feed their societies. So this river flooding, or sometimes lack thereof, was a real problem for the Mesopotamians. And they wanted to explain why that problem existed. And the explanation they came up with was that they had angry gods, gods who were punishing them if they weren't pleased by the Mesopotamians, punishing them by either making their rivers flood too much or not enough. Either way, the people suffered when these gods were angry. Believe it or not, the story of angry gods actually gave the Mesopotamians a sense of control over their environment. Because their thinking was, hey, if the gods are angry with us, all we have to do is make them happy with us, and then the rivers will flood just the right amount, and then we'll get the amount of food that we need to survive. Now this is where religion and politics start to mix at this very next step. 
because some people eventually started to say, you know, since some of us can farm more than we need to eat, why don't we have dedicated religious professionals, folks who are full-time priests and can spend all of their time praying to the gods, sacrificing to the gods, pleasing the gods, making sure the rivers do exactly what we need them to. And the folks who were farmers bought into this idea. They said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And so they allowed certain folks to be full-time priests. And they allowed those priests to live off the food that the farmers produce. And they built great things for those priests, like those ziggurats you saw, because the priests told everyone else, you need to do this for me, and really you need to do this for the gods, because the temple, although I might live in it, is where I worship the gods, where I sacrifice to the gods, where I please the gods, so that we'll all be better off. Um, when you were in that sort of situation, the situation of the priest, all you had to really do is keep everyone believing that the gods controlled their food supply because if they believe that, then really what they believe is that the priests help to control the food supply by pleasing the gods. My point is, religions don't have to be true or false to make a difference. It doesn't really matter whether or not the religious beliefs are true in any instance. What matters is that people believed them and they acted accordingly. And in this case, religion and politics got mixed together because the folks who convinced their followers that their religion was true were able to have political power over those same people as a result. So remember I said that your status in society had a lot to do with your job, right? I also said that depending on the time in Mesopotamian history, priests may have been at the top of society or soldiers may have been at the top of society. That all depended on what the society's concerns were at that time. Early on the biggest concern was how are we going to get food? And so priests were most important because people believed that if they pleased the gods, then that was going to be what produced their food. But as the city-states became more warlike, power slowly shifted from priests to the leaders of armies. As people's concerns shifted from how are we going to get food to are we going to die of invasion tomorrow? What theme do you think we're connecting to here for talking about conflict or war? If you guess theme three, you're right. A bigger question, though, is why might these early wars have been fought? If you think about theme one, and you remember what the Mesopotamian environment is like, you know that it was unpredictable. You know, they weren't always certain if their land was going to produce enough food or not. So the more land you had, the better chance you had that some of it was going to produce food for you. So ultimately, these early wars were fought over resources and the land that provided those resources. Okay, so we started this section with some important Sumerian contributions to society and I want to end the same way to answer that whole why do we care about Sumeria today. There's a couple important things that Sumerian society has left us with. Um, some of those are the architectural designs you saw earlier with those temples. Pyramid designs, step designs, ladder designs are still seen in architecture today. Of course, you have to have some math skills to produce such architecture. And I'm sorry if you don't like your math class or geometry class, but the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, were the first to use those types of mathematical figuring. Most importantly, probably, 
from this page right here is going to be the writing system they came up with. Cuneiform is its name. All right, this, here's an example of that writing system. It wasn't the writing we do today, uh, either on the computer or on paper with pencil or pen. This was more of a impression uh, style writing system where stamps were made into clay and the clay tablets were baked to make it permanent. So even though we don't use this style of writing today, the fact that Sumerians were the first to come up with writing is an important legacy for us today. And finally, there's this base 60 number system. What the heck is that and why should we care about that? Well, to explain that to you guys, let's start with the number system we use today. If you guys didn't know, it's called a base 10 number system. The reason it's called a base 10 number system is because it uses 10 different symbols to represent all the numbers that we have in our system. And there are those 10 symbols which I'm sure you guys all recognize. So what separates a base 60 number system from a base 10 number system? Well, in the base 60 number system, as many of you guys might have guessed already, there are 60 different symbols to represent all the numbers in the system. So imagine that this meant 10, and this meant 11, and this meant 12, and 13, and 14, and so on and so forth. That's how a base 60 number system works. Now I know you're probably thinking, that's incredibly confusing, how could you ever do math that way? Um, yeah, it is confusing to us because we haven't learned to do math that way, but it worked for the Sumerians. Now the big question, why do we care about a base 60 number system since we don't use it in our society today? Well, in some cases we still do use it, actually. Can you think of anything we still measure in 60s today? If you were thinking in terms of time, minutes, seconds, hours, that sort of stuff, you're on the right track, absolutely. So if you ever wondered why are there 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, why isn't it divided up in nice neat tens and one hundreds, thank the Sumerians for that. I'll leave you with this thought. Take a look again at the characteristic of civilizations here. Now, I know that we discussed in class, many of you guys don't agree with these characteristics. Don't think they should apply to all civilizations. But I want to ask you, how well does Mesopotamia fit with this list? Did it have cities? Did it have central government? Did it have a religion? job specialization, social classes, writing, art, architecture, taxes and public projects. Consider whether Mesopotamia has each one of these. We'll talk about that when you return to class. I'll see you after the weekend.